Also, we are now finishing this series on Jesus Christ, really taking a look at a lot of uh, uh, still shots of Jesus, trying to understand, and especially we're wrapping up this concept, maybe subtitle, of the deep impact of Jesus' death and resurrection and how it impacts our lives. And so we're going to be finishing today with the title called The Promise. Would you say that with me, The Promise? The Promise. Maybe one more time. The Promise. In the New Testament language, uh, there's a, a word called the. And it doesn't seem like it's an important word. It's called a definite article. And the beauty of the original language in the New Testament is that uh, it, it is used uh, in a way that gets across some ideas that we normally wouldn't really understand. You know, we've heard the terms like the real deal, the real McCoy, you know, the authentic. Well, this is what that word the does, especially in the, uh, in the Greek language. Uh, so that we know that whether it's a person or a thing or a concept that is in view, there is no doubt it is that one concept or that one person, that one thought that is in, that concept that is in view and nothing else. So it, it's, um, you can't be confused. And in the original language, they can use that word uh, to let you know and have more information where it doesn't necessarily show up in the English. It has nothing to do with flow, uh, as we, do, we worry about in the English, but we get information that is definite. That's why it's called the definite article, that is clear and unquestionable. A good example of that is, when, how many know the, uh, are, are vaguely familiar with the parable of the prodigal son? You know that? Yeah, and so we, we know when the son comes back, the father is so happy, he runs to his son, and the, I believe he tells the servants, go, uh, go kill the fatted calf, the fatted calf. And it is, the definite article is the is there, and the beauty of this is, they probably had a lot of calves, right? But there was that one fatted calf that they've been working with for 4-H, you know what I'm saying? They've been working with it, and they're working with it, and it is, and he doesn't say, you know, the, the, you know, the, the brown and the black, the brown, the cal, he doesn't have to say the fatted calf, and right away you know they knew which fatted calf that was. Same thing with this word the, it's a powerful thing. And so we have the promise, and we're going to take a look at this today. I had a lot of fun with this over the years. The word uh, power, the word power, uh, the original, uh, this is the transliteration, the word is dunamis, and we get the word dynamite from this. A very powerful word. Years ago, uh, before victory was started or even we could, any concept that we, victory would be existing, I was preaching at Aura uh, Gospel Chapel in Aura. Great people there, sweet people. And uh, Steve always had a joke there because uh, Steve was there and uh, a few others, uh, Fred Louise. But uh, Steve would have this joke that if you stood in the center of Aura and you fell down, you'd be out of Aura. <laughs> uh, it was so small. It was so small. But we had a lot of fun. But what I did one time, I was preaching on power. And, what I, and, and for some reason, that Sunday, uh, the husbands... Uh, the farmers uh, came, they nor weren't normally there, they were either working or doing something else, but they showed up that Sunday, and so we had a pretty good crowd there. And so we have farmers there, and, and uh, Bill Sanders, who's a, he was a teacher, and he was a, a farmer also, and I'm ready to uh, present this concept of power, so what do I do? Uh, I, I worked on this all week, and it looked authentic. I pulled out a stick of dynamite, and it looked real. And I bought two, two feet of fuse, and I put it in there. And I held this, and I held this with my left hand. And I'll tell you, it looks so authentic that the, the farmers who were slouching sat up real straight. <laughs> and they sat up against the back of their seat. And so as I'm flicking this big lighter, I'm looking at them, panning the crowd, looking at Bill Sanders. I said, did you ever check my credentials? Do you know what happened to the last congregation I worked with? <laughs> and I'm flicking this, and Bill Sanders stands up. Now, Brenda thought this was what routine, that it was all planned. It wasn't planned. Bill Sanders was nervous. And he says, Jim, now Jim. And I said, no, it's okay, Bill. <laughs> like that. And so I'm flicking this, I'm flicking this. And then I liked, I liked the, the two-foot fuse. And it's going, pssst. And of course, nothing happened. 
but even as I was standing there and I knew that this wasn't real, I felt this anticipation of this exploding power in a stick of dynamite or even an M80 or you know, cherry, whatever. I felt, I anticipated this explosive power dunamis. The word dunamis in the New Testament. And I guess the question is for us today as believers, do we anticipate that exploding power of the Holy Spirit in our lives? While Jesus was talking to his disciples before his death and resurrection, he said, these things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But when the helper the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring you into remembrance all that I have said to you. And let's look at this, because this is really important. There's some great, important uh, concepts that sometimes we, you know, we're cautious even about the songs that we sing here, because sometimes, uh, beautiful song, I can't go there, beautiful psalms, uh, but the, the, the song is saying, uh, the words are, uh, Lord, come to us in, in a way that it's like the Lord has go, gone off to Ohio or he's out in the, in the universe. You know, the, the Lord's the Holy Spirit's in us, right? God, very God. So we have to be careful. Sometimes with songs and things, we get these ideas, some of these uh, theologies or doctrines that get stuck in our head. And this is really important for us to understand this. And I believe we're going to have some clarity as we take a look at what happened on the day of Pentecost the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit alive and well in us as we're living our lives. In Matthew chapter 3, John the Baptist is preaching and speaking about uh, the Messiah who is very, who's to come very soon. And John would be baptizing before he knew it. But G, uh, ba John the Baptist is talking to the crowd and he says, I baptize you with water and, and I baptize you in or with water, makes sense, for repentance. This is not Christian baptism. This is the, the, the Jews' form of baptism for repentance. But he who is coming, this is Jesus, after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. The word with or in, actually. In or with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit actually is the medium into which you are baptized. And he, Jesus, is the one who does the baptism. You, you hear what I'm saying? It's Jesus who does the baptism in or with the Holy Spirit. Just as when we are baptized in Christian baptism in water, in or with the water, we have a person who's doing the baptizing, right? It's not saying that the Holy Spirit does the baptism. It says that Jesus will do the baptism with or in the Holy Spirit. And sometimes when we read about this Holy Spirit and with fire, right away we say, well, this is the day of Pentecost, the fire part of it, or I like, I like to say fire, but, but fire, that this, is the, this is the day of Pentecost, and you have the, Holy, the, have the Holy Spirit come down, yes, but you have tongues as if or like fire. It's not saying it is fire. It's saying it's something like fire, but that's not what we're talking about here because we always talk, I, from our classes, if you don't understand Scripture, it seems a little confusing. You always go to the Greek and you go to the context. It, yeah, go to the Hebrew and the Greek and go to the context. So let's look at this because Scripture will define Scripture. Amen? Amen. Now, here you go. I, John says, I baptize you with water or in water, same word, for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandal I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you, immerse you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Here's the definition. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. Who does that? That sounds like this is for the, that's the saved, right? He will gather his wheat into the barn, the saved, people, those who are, have been baptized with the Holy Spirit by Jesus, but the chaff will be burned with unquenchable what? Fire. And so there's our context of what this is saying, those that are unsaved. And just, again, as we are baptized in Christian baptism by a person who is, who is baptizing, us, uh, baptizing us in or with water, 
we read that the whole, uh, Jesus baptizes believers in or with the Holy Spirit. Does, does that make sense? See, because how we look at everything else down the road in other scriptures is going to be uh, really important to understand this baseline of what scripture is telling us. So let's go a little deeper even as we talk about the promise, the definite article, the promise. Not like any other promise. It is a promise that was given to the disciples. It's a promise that's actually given to us too and fulfilled. But after Jesus' death and resurrection, before he went up into heaven, he told his disciples this. He said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from where? Jerusalem. Now remember this, the word Jerusalem, this, this town, because we're going we're to see this a little further down. Next verse, Jesus says to his disciples, you are my what? Witnesses, remember this word, of all these things. And then Jesus says, and behold, look, pay attention, watch this. I am sending the promise. Now, in our English text, it says the promise, but sometimes we can't always go by that. We go back to original language, it is the promise. It's like un unlike any other promise. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city, Jerusalem, until you are clothed with what? Power. With what? Power. Power. So whatever this thing is, whatever is going on, the promise, it is connected with power. It is connected with dunamis. The type of power that is like that exploding power in a stick of dynamite. In the book of Acts, also written by Luke, Luke writes to a, a benefactor, Theophilus, in his gospel, in the beginning of Acts. We already know that this, this promise, the promise, has to do with power. And then we look at Acts chapter 1, as Luke writes now to Theophilus, as we look into the history of the church, Acts of the Apostles, better the Acts of the Holy Spirit, in the first book, O Theophilus, Luke writes, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given the commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, sounds familiar, doesn't it? But to wait for the promise, definite article, no doubt what it, this is, something's going to happen. The promise of the Father, which he, he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized, immersed, baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And again, who does the baptism? Jesus does the baptism. So whatever's going on here, all these things, all these terms are intertwined. It's the promise. The promise has to do, and I put in the, the gift. It's, it's, we're going to read this in a moment. It's the gift. It's unmerited. We didn't do anything to earn it. But that promise is also power. Dunamis. And whatever's going on here, that promise is not only the gift and power, it is being baptized or in in or with the Holy Spirit by Jesus himself. All the same thing. If you use one term, the other three, other three apply. If you use the third term all, in, in, in context, all the other three, they apply. This is powerful stuff. And you know, I love the honesty of Scripture. Because these disciples, you know, we look at them sometimes and we shake their, our heads, don't we? And they thought, those poor guys, you know, they just didn't get it. But neither do we, right? We're, we're still, we're a work in progress. But they don't have the Holy Spirit yet. This is when Jesus was talking, talking to them and they thought there was only one coming of the Messiah. They, they didn't think he would come to save our sins and then come back again. They just thought he would come, he would restore Israel back. The Israel would be back on the top of the food chain, so to speak. 
It would restore her to her former glory. So they say to him, after all these things about wait in Jerusalem, you're going to receive the promise, the gift, the power. You're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And they say, you know what this is like to me? And we do it. Pick a number between 1 and 10, and the person replies, blue. You know what I'm saying? Blue. And so after he's saying all these things, this is what they say. So Jesus... When they had come together, they asked the Lord, Lord, will you restore the kingdom of Israel? And Jesus says, it's not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive what? Power when the what? Who? The Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my what? Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Where? In Jerusalem. And then as it expands, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And this is what happened 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus on the first day of the week on a Sunday, just as the resurrection of Jesus was on a Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. And it is called the day of the Feast of Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, the disciples received the promise, the promise of the Holy Spirit, the gift. They were clothed with power. They were baptized with the Holy Spirit by Jesus. And Peter preaches the very first sermon recorded for the church because the church is born on the day of Pentecost. And these are some of the things that Peter is preaching to. He's preaching primarily to Jewish people, Jewish believers from every nation that have come for this festival. Peter says, says, brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he is both dead and buried and his tomb is with us today. Being therefore a prophet and not knowing, and knowing that God had sworn with him an oath that he would set one of his descendants on the throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Messiah that he would not be abandoned to Hades, to the grave, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are witnesses. We are witnesses who are in Jerusalem, fulfilling exactly what Jesus prophesied. Picks back up in verse 33. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, Having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you you yourselves are hearing and seeing. And then he, he, real, real strong, real hard impact. Then he says, let the house of Israel therefore know this, that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, friends, this is exciting. Watch this. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. Ever been cut to the heart? Your heart just broke, it just snapped. They were cut to the heart and said to Peter, those Jewish believers at the feast, what shall we do? How do we respond? Peter replies, repent, which means to change your mind. If you change your mind, you change your direction. And be immersed in Christian baptism. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, because that's who you belong to, right? You belong to Jesus. For the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the what? The gift of the... All of those definite articles in. It's the gift. It is the Holy Spirit. The very same promise that they had now been fulfilled in them, they our saying is fulfilled when we receive Christ. What they received on the day of Pentecost and the promise, so do we. So do we when we receive the gospel. Still with me? Make sense? It, it almost doesn't seem right, does it? But it is right. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift, definite article, of the Holy Spirit for the what? The promise. See, the promise is the gift. The promise is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Being clothed with power. It's all the same thing. 
For the promise, definite article, is for you, Jewish people, for your children, which makes it linear generation after generation, and for all those who are far off. And guess what? I've known some people who are really far off. But you know what I'm saying? It talks me, meaning not Jewish. Gentiles, that's us. For the promise is for you, for your children, for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. The promise that Jesus gave to his disciples is the gift. It is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. is being clothed with power. And Peter says, this is for you. This is for us. The promised Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit, being baptized as we are baptized in water, we are also baptized by Jesus into, in or with the Holy Spirit. We receive power in our lives. And we read, let's just read this. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all those who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. So those who received his word, I think Mel was talking about that today, receiving the message, receiving the word, were baptized, immersed in Christian baptism, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. 3,000 souls. Added means that you're placed into something. And what are you placed into? The church. The church is born on the day of Pentecost. They received the promise, as the disciples did. They received the gift of the Holy Spirit. They received the baptism in or with the Holy Spirit by Jesus. They received power also in their life. As we move ahead just a few chapters and watch these disciples who are now called apostles, those very disciples who ran and hid in fear, the boldness that they have, the courage that they have now, what changed them? In, in some of our Wednesday classes and our Sunday classes, we've talked about the very seeing Jesus Christ risen from the dead would be a big deal. It's a powerful thing. But there's also this. There's the Holy Spirit given to believers. And so we look at, a little further down in, I believe, chapter 5 or chapter 4. Well, chapter 5 for one moment. The Jewish council, the high priest, they've got uh, some of the apostles, and they, they give them this charge. Don't dare speak the name of Jesus. Don't dare teach about, don't say his name. Do not say his name. Do not bring this man's blood on us. And they said, okay, right? They responded, and we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Verse, uh, have another verse? Oh, not yet, okay. Another instance we have uh, Peter and John, they took on the high priest, Caiaphas, rulers, elders. We read that Peter has the Holy Spirit. Peter is speaking boldly, courageously to the Jewish leaders. Now, when they had seen the leaders, the boldness of Peter and John perceived that they were uneducated, common men. They were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Okay, that's 13. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. So they called them, the believers, of the, uh, the, the Jewish leaders called them the apostles, or Peter and John at least, and charged them again not to speak or teach at all the name of Jesus. And their response is, but Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard as witnesses as they are in Jerusalem sharing and teaching the name of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. Boldness of faith. 
And I want to ask you today, and I, this is for me too, I, I just want to ask you, what did they receive that we have not? Nothing. What have they received that we have not? Nothing. The promise is also ours. The promise is for you, for your children, and for all those far off. The baptism with the Holy Spirit by Jesus, the gift of the Holy Spirit, being clothed with power. Paul wants us to understand, to be enlightened, to know the power that is in us, the very power that raised Jesus from the dead is in us. And so why do we at times, and I, again, I do mean we, but why do we, why do we act like defeated disciples, sickly saints, fearful followers, or, or, or babbling believers? You know what I'm saying? Just, why? Why? Again, what did they receive that we did not? Nothing. On the day of Pentecost, theirs was the promise given to them. When we receive the gospel, it is the promise given to us, the fulfillment of it. The deep impact of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ for those who believe. Not rude, not crass, but bold. Because no matter what happens, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Amen? And so what this does, it gives, us, it gives us courage under fire from Peter to us, the church. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for doing righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them. Do not be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Always be prepared to make a defense, an apology, to anyone who asks you for the reason, for the hope that is in you yet do it with gentleness and respect. Having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will than for doing evil.